So welcome everyone to uh, this week magnets. Uh, as usual, the seminars are recorded and they will be made public available. Uh, the continued participation in a seminar after recording uh, from the beginning it constitutes agreement for the recording to be disseminated. Uh, we recommend to mute your mic and turn off your camera for uh, improving the, um, the recording. Um, so we have expanded our team. We want to welcome Anik van der Bonn and Richard Bono as well, uh, that will be helping with the um, with some part technical part and uh, organizing. Um, so it, as usual, we're gonna have 25 to 30 minutes presentation. Uh, you can drop questions in the chat box. Uh, we can read them afterwards. Uh, it's an informal, um, it's an informal seminar. So if you need to go, don't worry. You can catch it on the YouTube later. Um, after the seminar, it's gonna be 15, 10 to 15 minutes time for questions. Uh, you're welcome to to ask them. And then there will be a catch up at the end. Uh, you can you can stay if you want to catch up with friends and stuff. So uh, let me welcome uh, Jay Shah from uh, MIT. He's, go he's gonna talk about evidence for an intermittent lunar geodynamo. Dynamo, not geodynamo, <laughs> that is that. <laughs> All right, so you can share your screen, Jay. Okay, just one second. <clears throat> Great. Oh, great. We can looking? see it. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Jay. So yeah, thank you very much, Anita and Greg and the whole Magnets team for putting these together. Uh, it's uh, one of the positive uh, things of the pandemic that's able to bring everyone together for these seminars every month. And I'm very appreciative to be a part of it. Um, my name is Jay Shah. I'm a postdoc at MIT. Uh, in the Department of Earth, Atmosphere and Planetary Sciences. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm here to show you some work from a recent uh, paleo intensity experiment that we did on some Apollo regolith breccia to think about the lunar dynamo uh, in collaboration with Brenna Getzen, a former research, research assistant in our group, and our PI, Ben Weiss. So let's get to it. First, I'd like to just uh, dwell upon why we look at the moon in the first place from a paleomagnetic perspective. Um, we want to try and understand more about its interior generally and paleomagnetic data have helped us to show how it does have a differentiated interior with its surface crust with a mantle lying below that and then a conducting liquid core lying over a solid conducting core that has uh, generated these uh, magnetic fields from its self-sustaining dynamo throughout the history of the moon, pretty much. And the data that we have have shown this evidence of dynamo behavior, but they've also given us a few conundrums. And that's largely, I believe, to be a limitation of the data that we have itself, given that uh, we haven't uh, used the most, well, obtain the most accurate paleo intensities, and then also kind of have a biased sample selection, trying to seek out that uh, dynamo behavior. So the moon is a natural laboratory for dynamo theory. And we believe that there are very complex mechanisms going on, given that there is this high field epoch at the beginning of the moon history in, the first, in that first billion years or so, followed by a two billion year period of a low field epoch. And <clears throat> then uh, cessation of the dynamo. So within the Earth's orbit, we have the example of a planetary dynamo that's initiated, been sustained, and then ended for us to look at. And we have plenty of samples to look at it with. And first, and yeah, we just need to get some better, better data to fully understand the complexities of that dynamo and understand more of what's going on. So, Let's just start out by having a little bit of a recap on lunar paleomagnetism and what we know from the data so far. Um, just to take you through this uh, little uh, plot of the um, timescale of lunar paleo intensity history that we have uh, based on the data that 
have been acquired so far by labs around the world, where we have constrained this initial high field epoch in that first billion years or so, where we have magnetic field strengths of the range of about 100 microteslas being recorded um, for that first billion years that uh, are likely believed to have been driven by a thermally convective dynamo in the interior. Uh, and following this um, period of high field strength, we have this uh, protracted period of a much lower field strength dynamo activity where we have field intensities in the range of about seven upwards. And that goes on for about 2 billion years before being capped off by the cessation of the dynamo, which has recently been shown to have happened about a billion years ago or so. So we have this full history of a, a dynamo being initiated, sustained, and then ended for us to look at and piece apart. And we believe that there are various mechanisms that could have driven it for this long period of time that it has been active for. So there's the thermal convection that may have been driving those initial high field intensities, and then likely to be some precession going on between the, the core and the mantle some mechanical stirring of that convection to keep it going for a, up until about 2 billion years ago or so. Where, and then to explain the later, more recent field intensities that have been observed, there may have also been some core crystallization that further driven the dynamo on the moon. But these mechanisms uh, can't quite explain the intensities that we're seeing. So the average field intensities that we're seeing from the data can't really be justified by these mechanisms for generating a dynamo, the, the field strengths that they would generate and for the time periods that it would generate them for. So there, there may well be something missing and that could be in our sampling, which may have been biased to actually find dynamos. So we've been looking at samples that will have demonstrated remnants properties that would give us really strong paleo intensities whilst overlooking samples that maybe do give much weaker paleo intensities that could potentially suggest that there's been intermittence in this dynamo. There's a paper by Evans et al in 2018, which uh, suggested that dynamo intermittence may well explain how uh, they were specifically looking at the thermal convective dynamo in, the, in that first high field epoch, but potentially how such dynamo field behavior, which based on the lunar energy budget could only have lasted for such a small period of time, could have been stretched out and conserving that energy to be dispensed throughout the history of the moon that may be consistent with also periods of dynamo inactivity amongst these periods, dynamo high field strength, and resulting in a lower average field than what we've seen with the sample so far. So we may have seen these periods of high field strength accompanied by the periods of low field strength, which will come out to a lower average field, but we just haven't seen the data that would justify these periods of low field strength. So these may have been mechanisms that aren't even that exotic. Uh, we have reversals in the earth and perhaps the moon also underwent such field reversals and we just haven't required the data in order to observe this and the accompanying potentially low period, uh, periods of low field strength uh, amidst the reversals. There could be some secular variation going on in the moon that we haven't quite observed yet. And there could be some sort of a start stop dynamo mechanism where the moon was oscillating between having enough energy to sustain a dynamo and then falling below that threshold for dynamo activity that could have extended the longevity of the dynamo and conserved work to conserve the energy of the lunar energy budget. So there's actually this paper, this cool, yeah, it's a cool study um, by Le Pollard et al. Uh, in 2019, where they took the NRM to susceptibility ratio of 161 samples from the Apollo archives and worked out a crude approximation to a paleo intensity for these samples. And they did find a distinctly higher average field intensity for this high field epoch in the first billion years of field activity, followed by about 2 billion years of a lower average field intensity. But amongst these samples, they also found this regime of high field intensities amidst periods of well, samples which displayed low field intensities. 
and certainly giving um, support to the idea that we just need to sample more of the rocks in order to potentially find these samples which exhibit low field intensity uh, recordings. So we need more accurate uh, paleo intensity protocols in order to actually achieve these uh, field intensities that we'd like to get. And here I'd like to talk to you about uh, controlled atmosphere thermal demagnetization, which will help us to get to that goal. So controlling the atmosphere, the, the aim of the game here is to have the amount of oxygen in your heating environment such that you're not going to oxidize your magnetic carriers and you're not going to reduce your magnetic carriers. So the partial pressure of oxygen we'd like to be in our oven to be the same as what the samples experienced in the moon. And the liter literature is actually excellent for outlining what the samples, oxygen fugacities, the oxygen partial pressure would have been under their formation. And trying to do so under vacuum is far too oxidizing. Argon atmosphere is also far too oxidizing and doping that argon atmosphere with hydrogen ends up being too reducing. So we achieve the ideal oxygen environment by mixing together hydrogen and carbon dioxide at proportions that we can calibrate to be uh, varying over the range of temperatures as you're heating the sample to react to form an equilibrium oxygen composition that will be of the lunar oxygen fugacity. So thereby not oxidizing and not reducing our magnetic carriers in our samples. And we can actually achieve this for nearly all planetary samples now by making our system slightly more reducing or slightly more oxidizing, depending on what the samples would have liked. And just to show you a little plot that makes this very evident, and this is a lunar basalt analog that has been heated in air, and we can see that it demagnetizes beautifully with the magnetite Curie temperature. And if we throw that sample in a controlled atmosphere, we see that we don't sacrifice that camasite to magnetite. We preserve that camasite magnetization and demagnetize it with the Curie temperature of camasite, retaining that magnetic remnants record. And we've developed a new system that can actually do this now in thermal cycling uh, in less than 25 minutes, uh, which is to, uh, like a factor of four faster than what we've previously been able to do, which further inhibits uh, the chemical alteration of the samples by having them at high temperatures for shorter periods of time, as well as facilitating a uh, faster, greater sample throughput and making these experiments way more feasible because they are time consuming as they are. So now we have the experimental protocol down in order to continue to um, expand our understanding of this lunar dynamo throughout time, we need to look at more sample lithologies that can help us to do that. So I'm gonna focus on the Apollo regolith breccia. If we go back to that plot by Le Pollard et al, 2019, and you can see that littered throughout um, the timeline, we have these light blue points, which are the regolith breccia, and they are all throughout the Apollo timeline and can help to sample specifically this uh, low field epoch where there's just so many of these samples. So we can increase our current sparsity of data by looking at these regular pressure. And just to focus now a bit more on those, I'm gonna show you a little schematic on how they form and why they're excellent magnetic recorders. So why they're actually well suited to our goals. So the regular pressure formed on the surface of the moon from this lunar soil that would have been lying on, on the surface due to impacts and just commutation of the materials to have this, but maybe it was basaltic materials uh, or even relict lunar regolith breccias themselves on the surface of the moon carrying their own ancient NRM lying within the surface ambient field of the moon at that time when an impactor came along and crashed into the surface of the moon, resulting in the heating, compaction, and lithification of a new root lunar regular pressure, which has now acquired a new thermoremnant magnetization in its glassy matrix that is binding together these clasps, which may well have preserved their own ancient NRM from prior to the impact, 
or have been remagnetized to that um, lunar surface field at the time of the impact with a thermo remnant magnetization. And one of the reasons why these samples are so excellent for a, from a paleomagnetic perspective is that this glassy matrix contains these very fine grained iron nickel grains that are likely of single vortex grain size and as such would have very long relaxation times and capable of retaining that magnetic field information for geologic time scales and being ideal for our analysis. So let's look at those samples that um, we're working with here. We have a young regolith breccia 60255 and an ancient regolith breccia 60019. So I was digging through the uh, Apollo 16 journal to find why they picked up this sample that I've spent so long working on in the first place. What, what was the guy thinking and what was his intentions? And it turned out that he, he picked it up because purely because it was the size of half of a grapefruit and he found that very interesting. As we can hopefully hear if this works in the little audio uh, with him chatting with Houston. Uh, sure do, Charlie. Sure do, Charlie. Okay, did you copy that about this rock I picked up a half grapefruit size? Yeah, we sure did. It sounds very interesting. We sure did. It sounds very interesting. Okay, and it's going in bag 17. Okay, bag 17. Yeah, very interesting. And then um, our ancient regular structure, 60019. Um, I think it's a little bigger than half a grapefruit, maybe a full grapefruit. Here it is on the surface. Um, and then just another picture of after they picked it up. So just a little before and after. That's all they had for that, 60019. But here's, here's what I found most remarkable is that just after picking up these special samples that I've devoted so much of my life to, um, captured John Young, one of the greatest moments in history, where he captured his co-astronaut, Charlie Duke, just after having picked up 60255 and 60019 and having to relieve himself into a crater right next to the lunar module. And sadly or fortunately, this, uh, this moment is um, fairly obscured by the glare of the sun but there you have it, uh, one of the greatest moments in history. And I just found that quite amusing. So this is our little segment of the half grapefruit, our young ancient, uh, our young regular pressure 60255 coming in at about 1.7 billion years old. Uh, and we've sent the sample uh, for our own radiometric dates to get a tighter constraint on that. and. You can see that it is um, this dark glassy matrix, fine grain matrix with these white feldspathic clasps amidst that matrix. And here is a picture of our sample of 60019, our ancient regular breccia coming in at about 3.3 .3 billion years old. And again, we've sent this for our own radiometric dates to get the tighter constraint on that. And again, it is this fine grained glassy matrix with these white feldspathic clasps. And getting to the data itself, uh, I just want to show you initially the yeah the Zydefeld plot from our young regular thread 60255, which uh, you can see this low temperature component coming off. And then it just is completely lost to noise and not really anything that looks beautiful in any way, uh, which is kind of the behavior of, well, as in with regards to the high temperature component, there's not really anything that we can see of a, a distinct component. And this is kind of the behavior of all of our samples from 60255, where there's not really a strong high temperature component. There's not much unidirectionality and there are very large mad angles. So there's not really much of a component there in the high temperature, which is consistent with, we're finding, 
a zero field paleo intensity having been recorded by the matrix from 60255, uh, where our arrive plot in the high temperature portion has a plateau that is of zero field. And I just want to draw attention to the scale on the y-axis and the x-axis, where you can see that it's about two orders of magnitude lower in the y-axis. So all these perturbations we can see are actually very small in relation to how much PTRM it's gaining. And if we stretch that out onto the same axes, uh, it's just this one long flat line corresponding to a zero paleo intensity. Now, if we do the same for 60019, our ancient regular structure, again, we can see this low temperature component coming off and then in the high temperatures, we're not really seeing anything, uh, which we see amongst all of our samples from 60019 matrix uh, with large mad angles and not really much of a consistent direction. And again, this we're finding to be consistent with a zero field early intensity being recorded by this ancient regular structure. Again, the y-axis is much smaller than that x-axis, so it's gaining a ton of PTRM with not much NRM to lose. So just putting this into the context of the rest of the data that we have so far, um, you can see that we have these new regular pressure that plot within error being a zero field paleo intensity in that low field epoch where we're expecting to see these middling field intensities that would be respective of a procession driven dynamo or core crystallization. Just adding to this um, a couple of paleo intensities of some regular pressure that are from Jerome Gatschecker and his soon to be published work from the high field epoch and from the low field epoch where he is finding paleo intensities using a controlled atmosphere system and so he a thermal paleo intensity. So we're not just finding a ton of zero field paleo intensity suddenly. And what it does seem to be is that we have possibly found first evidence of intermittence of the dynamo. So these periods where we're expecting to find field intensities, we're finding very low field paleo intensity, suggesting that perhaps the average field of these epochs may be much lower and that there may be some more complex, but not necessarily so exotic, uh, mechanisms going on with regards to lunar dynamo that we should explore further. So yeah, just in conclusion, I feel like we're getting closer to understanding the history of lunar dynamo, but there's a ton more work to be done to fill out the sparse record that we have so far from the data, which I think oxygen fugacity controlled uh, tele paleo intensities will help us significantly to do so, as well as looking at the regular pressure of which there are so many, especially in the low field epoch. And we now have the first paleo intensities that support an intermittent lunar dynamo, which I feel we should explore further. And just before I close out, I wanted to give a little teaser for something else that we found in this study that we're still working on, still trying to figure out fully. Uh, so we got a class from the sample and subsampled this class. This is our young regular structure from 1.7 billion years ago. And the class itself is showing a paleo intensity as well as some unidirectionality amongst its high temperature component. And it's a non-zero paleo intensity. And we're trying to explore this. It may well be, I'm very excited by the prospect of being, but I don't know, I'm uh, keeping some caution there that it has actually retained an ancient NRM from prior to the formation of the regolith, which would be really cool, but we've sent out the sample of the class four dating to see if that fits that theory at all, as well as trying to look at the magnetic mineralogy within the class a little further to see how, how reliable recorders they are, as well as looking at the magnetic mineralogy of the, the rest of the materials we've been looking at to verify how, how great the recorder they are. So that, that, that is yet to be done, but on the horizon, hopefully. And yeah, that, that's all. I'll leave it there for questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Let's give Jay a big uh, round of applause. And uh, we are open for questions. Uh, there was a question uh, from Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, 
asking how many of the high field samples were not subjected to high fields on sample return. Any? How many of the high field samples were not subjected to high fields? Is that on during during yeah so during the mission kind of thing? Uh, I think so. Maybe Lisa can unmute. Uh, yeah, yourself. So just um that high field seemed to be associated with samples that had been subjected to a moderate field in the air, in the spaceship on the way home. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if any of the samples have not been. That's a good question, I guess. I mean, I'm not really sure uh, about the fields that they experienced amongst different missions and that kind of thing, but we're seeing low fields from samples that are obtained from the same missions. Okay, well, that's good. So I think that would potentially suggest that it's not like a, you know, blanket, they've all been zapped on Apollo 11 kind of thing. Maybe, I, I don't know, that's a, that's a good thing to explore though, certainly. I, yeah, I, I would never want to rule out contamination, but I think... Because uh, all the ones we looked at, that was what it was. They were IRMs and it was, there was no high field. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Once you've given it an IRM, you can't recover it. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, even a small IRM, you just... That's interesting and worrying at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, do you have other questions? Or I see Win as a rice hand. Yeah, Win. Yeah, hi, hi, Jay. Uh, anyway. Interesting talk. Um, I, I'm probably going to uh, expose my ignorance yet again, but I was just thinking of the, the samples you say that they were, there's a TRM captured by the, the this um, conglomerate, the regolith. But is there any evidence of any post TRM uh, shock? You know, obviously a lot of meteor impacts on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. And if there's any possibility of any demagnetization occurring from uh, impacts. Or can you, can you see any clues of uh, any evidence of, um, you know, because doesn't it doesn't shouldn't really take a huge amount of impact to demagnetize. Uh, well, I'm not sure about cameras of, of these clasps themselves. That yeah, I, was just, I mean, uh, I mean, just the, the, the class sample, I, I it's kind of like a far fetched idea that I, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of holding on to and thinking is really cool. And I mean, Ben is way more skeptical than I am on this. And I think I'm just very hopeful. So, I mean, certainly it could have been somewhat demagnetized, but if it has been that it's not been completely demagnetized, at least, I mean, it's still recording about 10 microtesla field. So that I think the, the significant thing at least is the fact that it has recorded a field from a period of time. And if it's been able to retain that, even going through shock, then it's potentially been exposed to an even higher field from like its original remnants was from a higher field, potentially. Okay. It was also nice to see, you know, these uh, your your TRM curves. You don't see many TRM curves that haven't just completely chemically altered from any of these lunar materials. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was <laughs> very happy to see that they do actually seem to agree with the predictions of uh, Nagy et al.'s paper from a couple of years ago. Yeah, sure that that's much. something we're always bearing in mind, like around that four hundred <laughs> uh, Celsius. Well, point. Everything seems to be held in. Uh, within about 200 uh, centigrade of the of the Curie point, right? All the remnants used to be held in there, or mm -hmm. the demagnetization curves. See, that, that was where most of the response was. So that was good. Anyway, enjoyed your talk. Very nice. Thanks, Wen. Thank you. Uh, we have two raised hands. So Greg was first, and then Nick. Greg, do you want to go? Hi, Jimmy. Um, that was a really, really interesting talk. Um, I guess my question is, is kind of this. Um, Pre pre prelim result on the 10 micro tesla i mean have you actually thought about also the cooling rate corrections of what they would do to the result because i mean you're heating from room temperature to 700 and back again um in you said was it 25 minutes and that's that's yep. like a that's a, a, a one degree per second um temperature change without any hold time 
I mean, you know, how, how much in thermal equilibrium are the samples getting to at, at high temperatures? And what kind of cooling rates then is, does that have for your experiments? Because that's going to potentially crank up your intensity values quite substantially. Mm -hmm. Would wait, so would having a longer hold time help us with that? Oh, so es essentially, I guess you have to think about the size of your sample. Um, yeah. Because once the oven reaches temperature, your sample is lagging behind a little bit. It needs yeah. to reach the thermal equilibrium with, with, with the furnace. Um, but also just the fact that, that, you know, even if you just heat it straight up and then cool back down again, the, the, the rate of temperature change, the cooling rate is pretty huge. Um, and that would, um, that would mean that the um, cooling rate process, the, 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 the um, acquisition of TRM in the lab is going to be very different to that acquired in, in nature. And that will have a big impact on your uh, paleo intensity results. Okay. Yeah, that's so something to think about. Yeah, no, definitely something to think about. Uh, I mean, yeah. With regards to just to clarify more on the experiment, uh, heating rates and cooling rates, uh, it heats up in about, I would say, uh, 15 minutes or so. And then we have a hold time of about five minutes at temperature. And we have a thermocouple right next to the samples as well to check that the sample temperature within the controlled atmosphere tube is actually the temperature of what the oven is reading because they're normally fairly different. Um, so we go by the sample temperature within the atmosphere tube and we cool down in about five minutes, I'd say. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, it's a good point, the cooling rate, the comparison between the experiments and nature. It's a really good question uh, to investigate. So we have Nick, mm -hmm. with your you... hand is raised yeah, to yeah. pose the uh, question. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the talk, Jay. We've been watching your talk as a, <laughs> as a family over breakfast here in California. <laughs> and my nine-year-old Maddie has a, has a question for you. Oh, really? So, um... It's really cool that you handle the moon rocks, but do you always have to use gloves or are you sometimes allowed to use your bare hands? We have to use gloves. Uh, I have to be very responsible when I'm working with this. As much as there is temptation to actually touch the moon rock myself, I, I do refrain. I wish I could be so lucky. And why do you have to wear gloves? Just to prevent contamination. If they with regards to us, I mean, I'm not, I'm not very magnetic as I am, so I'm not going to magnetize the rocks with my fingers. Uh, but if anyone ever wanted to do any studies uh, on the samples after me, I'm sure they don't want my sweaty fingers all over them. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We always welcome questions from early career scientists. You're the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And we have a question from, yes, Andre, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jay. Uh, <clears throat> the, que uh, the, question, uh, the question is, uh, and it's more, it's more like a concern. And uh, I'm mm -hmm. wondering why did you uh, select a uh, uh, regolith and Brexit and because it's known from the terrestrial impacts that brachii are generally not very good recorder of uh, of, uh, ge of geomagnetic field, and uh, mm -hmm. how can you sh how, how can you be sure that it acquires theory? Uh, but uh, in particular, that you you, you absolutely uh, don't have field controls uh, whether it's. Uh, uh, where, with respect to the crater, uh, even you don't have a control which uh, which impact event created that that particular breakthrough, isn't it? So, well, it's it is my understanding that they were heated up during the impact itself, given that the radiometric clocks are reset during that impacting. Uh, so they uh, did so they. I, I think they do get heated up and then cooling down to acquire an ETRM. Oh, yeah. OK, so you the, didn't mention that. 
with regards to the mineralogy, they're excellent for paleomagnetic analysis and they and they have been behaving very well with our controlled atmosphere system, which is yeah, just okay. why they're yeah. targets for us at least. Yeah. And uh, uh, and uh, in continuation of this, did you also try basalts? So I I don't think I have tried a basalt. I might have. Um, but yeah. the, the issues that we found with basalts in the past are that because they have troilite in them, the troilite often will reduce to iron metal and then release that sulfur. So mm -hmm. until we yeah. can control sulfur fugacity, we can't right. prevent the alteration oh, of that okay. troilite. Okay. So we see this big spike in magnetization yeah. once oh. we once we see. convert that troilite to iron. Yeah. So until we can do that, we can't look at the basalts. Yeah. And also the basalts are from a pretty discrete time period on that lunar record. So it'd be great to look at as many basalts as we can, but we can't look at the whole time scale. Yeah, of the on yeah, that, uh, yeah that's, uh, that's understandable. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, great talk, Jay. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Space people? Nope. Oh, we have no. another race. Oh, no, I think that's... Oh, Win, you have another question? Yeah, oh, you wrote some, sorry. Chat, but I yeah. was just curious as to whether, Jay, uh, if you've got any uh, grain size estimates of the magnetic carriers. Not yet. Okay. That would be interesting to do, uh, obviously, to look at the um, reliability of the remnants, but also for the cooling rate uh, corrections that Greg mentioned. I think yeah. we, could, uh, we could get a better estimate if we if we knew the distribution of particle sizes you had. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah I'm going to make that priority, good. honestly, actually, because <laughs> there's a lot of yeah magnetic mineralogy, rock magnetism experiments we need to do on my samples, and yeah. we just don't have a lot of the instruments in our lab, so it's not the first. Uh, Port of call typically. So sure. yeah. I'm going to get to the magnetic mineralogy as soon as I can. Yeah, great. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jay. I think uh, we don't have other questions. Do we? Okay, not for now. Then uh, uh, thanks again, Jay, for giving this uh, very nice talk. And uh, I think we can uh, we can conclude here the recorded part. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Depending on the region you are, are we still recording, Greg? Uh, sorry, do you want to throw up the last slides just to let people know what's coming? Um, oh yeah, sure, uh, sure, in sure. In the next magnets. Jay, could you please? Uh, uh, Stop sharing, or oh, okay, I can kick you out. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, the next seminar is the 14th of April. We are going to have Andrea Biederman. We are going to circulate the more information about this. Um, then we are going to have a break for the EGU that's going to last two weeks. So we are going to be all very busy. And if you're not there, it's going to be a nice break, I think. And after EGU, we are gonna, from May, we're gonna start uh, um, having one EU, Europe, US time and one Eastern Hemisphere time slot. So we're gonna have speakers from uh, Australia, La Trobe University, where a few lined up, but uh, the problem is still to, to, to organize. And we always welcome more speakers, especially we encourage uh, uh, early career scientists um, and if you have any suggestions or feedback or anything, you please feel free to contact uh, me or Greg uh, by email or via um, our social media. So thank you very much. <laughs>